I'm Stephen Cole and welcome to The Answers Project, where we try and make sense of some of the trickiest questions facing us in this increasingly complicated world. We have access to some of the best brains on the planet to see if they can help shed light on some of the most pressing ethical, scientific, geopolitical and philosophical quandaries. And I'm joined by Mari Beveridge, who's going to help me unravel this week's question. So, Mari, what have you got for us this week? Today, Stephen, we are asking, what is the right age to start school? Well, a very good question. Um, but looking beneath the question, I suppose this is really uh, important for evaluating how children develop. So the alternative question is, does starting at an early age have long-term advantages? Well, surprisingly, there's not actually a lot of research about what the ideal age to start school is, despite its obvious relevance to things like policy making. Um, there's plenty about how to structure schools and about curriculum, but there was not an abundance on the actual age, the starting age, and what the right age is. When you say school, do you mean um, nursery school or kindergarten? So, for the purpose of this podcast, we are not talking about nursery, which is also known as preschool or pre-primary education. We're looking at primary school education. So, on average, around the world, children start primary school at the age of six. That's certainly the case across Europe. But in some countries, um, children will start as young as four, and in others, they'll start as late as seven. Give me the spectrum of ages across countries. OK, so on one side of the scale, we have Northern Ireland, where kids have to start primary school at four. That's the youngest in Europe. And the rest of the United Kingdom and Malta, where kids start at five. And then on the other end of the scale, we have countries like Finland, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Croatia and Bulgaria, where kids don't have to be in primary school education until they're seven. Have a listen to these children around the world. Hi, my name is Alma. Here in Sweden, you have to start school when you're six. My name is Jazz. In Bahrain, you have to start primary school when you are six years old. My name is Madeleine Buerta, and I live in Durban, South Africa. In South Africa, you have to start primary school by the age of seven years old. My name is Takeshi. I am eight years old, and I am from Tokyo. In Japan, it's compulsory to start primary school when you are six years old. My name is Teddy and I am 11 years old. Here in Bulgaria, we have to start school at the age of seven. Well, I'm surprised. Uh, I mean, we've just heard it's seven years old in Bulgaria. That, to me, is very late. I, I can't imagine that starting that late could, in fact, be good for a child. Some parents, especially working parents, do want their children to go to school as early as possible because that means they're not going to have to pay for what is effectively very expensive uh, childcare. So they would say the younger the better. But I would say that children need socialisation from an early age. And I also believe in learning by rote, uh, because I think it trains the discipline of your mind. And anything that trains your mind early has to be good for the long term. Because children, i found, are like sponges. They are incredibly absorbent. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with you. Children's brains often likened to sponges. Um, but there are a lot of people that argue that forcing kids to learn by rote and sit exams at a really early age, like four, can be really damaging. Um, another is issue is also facing separation from their parents you know, too early, and, and whether or not kids are emotionally ready for that. Um, this is certainly the view of uh, Wendy Elliott, who founded the Save Childhood movement in the UK. She is a big believer in letting kids start their formal education later. If you ask a child at a very young age to read or write, you know, they will actually do that. They'll produce results. But what we know from the evidence is that later on in their teens, the last thing they want to do is those particular activities. If, if we put children under too much pressure to do things when they're not developmentally ready to do it, just not in tune with where they are, I mean, it's likely to put off the desire to do it later. So it's about dispositions for me. So that's interesting. She's saying if you force a child to do something at a young age, they'll resent it later on. Does that sound familiar to you? Do you agree with that? No, I don't. 
Um, Why not? Uh, because uh, I don't think they, they know they're being put under pressure, and I certainly don't think they, they, um, uh, they remember uh, so-called pressure. I think they'll normally, children, are very positive <laughs> little beings, and they will bring, take positives away. They'll remember the teacher, perhaps. They'll remember the class. They'll remember uh, their schoolmates. Uh, they'll remember playing. But I don't think they remember pressure. I, I, I certainly don't remember. Sort of, I remember learning by rote, and that, I, that was something you had to do. That was I remember time. being forced to do maths, and I really hated that. Yeah, well, that's, why you're, that's why you're a journalist. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we all failed maths. That's why we're all journalists. <laughs> um, but I, I failed maths. I mean, I, I learned how to uh, hold a cricket bat more than I did about uh, the squaw on the hippopotamus or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you're a journalist. Oh, but yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why I always messed up my expenses. Um, but uh, is she not suggesting that we just let children play until they're seven years old? I mean, it's actually sort of what she's getting at. She says that all of the evidence that she's found suggests that letting children play is what they really need at a young age. And, and she also says that we essentially need to destigmatize this word play. It's not actually a bad thing. In a way, we need another word from play because play, if you look in Scandinavian countries, the quality of play is much more like a, a science lab, you know, or an extraordinary construction. Um, environment it's incredibly deep immersive learning so i think we uh, our, our focus should be how we maximize um children's exploration of the environment in a in a safe and constructive way and, and in a way remove interference as much as we possibly can so we we can create extraordinarily interesting environments that children have a sense of freedom in the way they interact with that. But we're, we're cultivating all the skills and capacities and the kind of um, mindsets that they need to be phenomenal learners later on. Yeah, play. So what is play? I mean, this, this, the, the, the key, the skill from teachers, nursery teacher or a primary school teachers, uh, is all about making work be like play or play like work and learning through play is great because you're learning through um, using your hands exploration or exploration I absolutely agree with that and hopefully they'll be enjoying it uh, the key I think at that age for me is reducing the level of competition mm -hmm. so that I mean, and teachers are very good at this, I think, in nursery teachers. They're aware that you don't want children competing against each other at a very early age. Everybody should get a reward. Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner every time. I think that's very important. But I, I do think sometimes the games are a bit simplistic and they could add a little bit of psychology to the games. Um, whether you adjust those games to the different children, mm. well, that's a different question. Well, you'll notice there that she referenced the success of Scandinavian countries. And uh, Wendy's right, Scandi countries always do really, really well in these charts uh, called the PISA chart, uh, which is, stands for Programme for International Student Assessment. Um, and they're used to assess how 15-year-olds across the world uh, are doing in maths and science and reading, which are the sort of three key areas. And they've been around for about 20 years, and Finland always does really, really well in them. They're certainly leading uh, in Europe in these PISA charts. Um, so a lot a lot of people sort of look to Finland as um, a, a sort of inspiration for what 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 people are doing right and what like what sort of curriculum is is a, a good example for small children. I don't know if I could uh, accept the Finnish example because it must be such a small uh, group of people uh, and very small groups of families. But I mean, what age do children start in Finland? So they start primary school as late as seven years old. But, uh, again, doing a bit of research into this, I found supposedly they end up with the highest educational standards uh, in Europe. But I would think it's quite a formal uh, education. I guess one of the arguments is that if children start later, then they will not benefit from 
as long a time in formal education and therefore you know how can that be as good but the sticking point here is what kind of learning environment children should be in so the Finnish model is less about learning your numbers and your letters and the more formal side of it and it's more about social skills early on and here is a Finnish education expert Petteri Ilo on how their system works there. In Finland, we start, or the children start their school when they, the year that they turn seven. Just a few years back, it became mandatory that every single kid has to attend uh, uh, kindergarten or primary school, uh, uh, preschool, whatever that term is. But basically one year before you start grade one. And that's a half a day of instruction that you that is con- compulsory for everybody. And the, the primary objective for that year is to teach and model uh, social skills for our, for, uh, for our kids so that they're ready to, to, to be in the social situation and learning situations when they enter school. So basically through organized play and free play and, and uh, you know, games and these kind of things, the main objective is to is to get the students comfortable socializing with different types of uh, uh, personalities and, 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 you know, get along with, with uh, friends and, and uh, other kids. Well, I think that's great. Uh, I, I agree uh, with that, uh, um, Pateri uh, Ello, uh, on what uh, is being said. What he seems to be saying is that, there are ch- that children need to learn social skills. But is that the job of, 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 of the school so much more? What about the parents? I, I believe you can socialise children at a young age, but because they are so receptive, um, uh, and uh, that goes back to the sponge idea, um, while also doing the formal stuff. But I would like to think they're taught a lot of this socialisation, uh, which will mean basically manners and ways of behaviour, at home by their parents, won't they? Yeah, I mean, so I actually put a very similar point to Petter in. I said, you know, can't you start teaching a five-year-old how to play and do maths at the same time? And uh, this is what he said. Well, I'm a strong believer in our system. So I would say no, because there are so many valuable things that they are learning. There are so many important life skills and and, uh, just, you know, skills connected to being a human being that are practiced in that grade zero year and before that, that I don't see the reason why we should rush with the academic skills too early, again, referring to the argument of uh, cognitive uh, development. In short, you need to teach them to be humans before you need to teach them how to be academics. That's that's well put in my mind, and I, I can stand behind that because, I mean, I refer to PISA studies now. Now uh, Finland has done really well in reading reading and, and science and, and basically all the categories. And yet our students start formally practicing academic skills at, you know, year, year uh, when they're seven or, or six. What happens to if a child has been doing formal education for one year? So age now eight or nine and then starts falling behind does it matter uh really they have so much time to make up uh that ground because every child develops at a different level at different age uh some will be ahead of others as they ought to are because the great thing is we are all different but do they let him play until he figures it out in which case they could wait till he's late teenager um <laughs> Are they rigorous about their testing? I think there's a little bit of leeway, but basically the foundation of the Finnish system seems to be that all kids learn in different ways and at different paces, and which, you know, as you say, is kind of hard to argue with. Um, there's that famous quote, which is often wrongly attributed to Albert Einstein, uh, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing <laughs> it's stupid. And um, this is, uh, here's a Petri Ila again. Kids develop their cognitive abilities developed in different phase, paces and uh, you know some kids might already be readers when they come to school but for some kids it might take a little more time for them to get you know reading skills going or, or writing skills so in Finland we believe that we can we don't have to rush things and we cannot especially in that early age you know make standardized testing saying that every single seven seven year old kid should be 
you know, this reading level or writing level or math level, but actually, you know, give some time. And then let's say in the springtime of first grade, if, if a student is still not progressing in reading skills, then we start, you know, seriously looking into if there are some learning disabilities or, or uh, some other things that are hindering the, the process. But the idea that kids are developing cognitively in different, different speeds, that's one of the governing ideas, as I understand, in our uh, education system. We've heard from people that say, let the children play. But what about those who believe we should be getting kids in school as soon as they're walking? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Northern Ireland is one of these countries where children start primary school particularly early. It's at the age of four there. Um, I spoke to Stephen McCord, who is the president of Ulster Teachers Union and, of course, a teacher himself. And he explained how school works in Northern Ireland. So children start school here at the age of four, and that is a compulsory starting age. We do have nursery schools before that, so lots of children will have had some nursery education before they go into compulsory education. Over here, it's very much about educating them through play. And I've got a nephew who's in, who's in P1, and I'll give you an example. From the moment they start, they are learning and they're absorbing. So from those little shapes that are on his little hanger, they start to identify the truck with their name. And very quickly, they're starting to use Jolly Phonics. They're starting to work together with other children as a team. And it is very much the curriculum being taught through play. And there's that word again, play. Yes, absolutely. So this seems to be the key to primary school learning uh, almost universally. And despite the very large two or three year gap between starting ages in somewhere like Northern Ireland and somewhere like Finland, Stephen McCord says it's really not dissimilar from what kids are doing in Finland's pre-primary schools. Um, I was lucky enough to visit Finland just at the start of the year um, and was able to go round and there's a primary school. And the learning is so similar. It's just done at slightly different stages. So the children were learning again through outdoor learning. They were working with one another. They were very quickly looking at shapes and sizes of things, for example, in a water pit. And it's exactly the same thing here. So, you know, as we heard there, it might just be a case of semantics. What we call primary school over here in the UK, Finnish people would see as pre-primary education. Um, I asked Stephen McCord whether he thought Northern Ireland uh, would benefit from a Finnish education system, and this is what he said. I actually think that the age of four over here works very well. The one thing that I think we would like to see is a little bit more flexibility. So, for example, if you have a child who's born right at the end of June, or you might have a multiple birth, or you might have a premature baby, it's important to have a little bit of flexibility. And at the moment, we don't have that. Now, that is a very interesting point, and it's um, uh, uh, an arguable point for a lot of parents who don't like these cut-off dates for entering a school year because children born in the summer might face an unfair disadvantage. Because if a child is born at the end of August, he or she will have just turned five a few days before his first day of school. Exactly. So he would be in the same year group as a child who turned five in September of the previous year, which would give that child uh, a year's de uh, developmental lead. And that's quite a significant amount of time for a five-year-old. Um, these children are often called summer babies or young-for-year children. And um, when I was doing my initial research for this show, I came across a report by a researcher called Thomas Cornelison. And he is an economics professor at the University of Essex. And last summer, he co-authored a study on this exact issue um, called The Benefits of Starting School Early. And it, it looks at the issue of deferring children. Yeah, so what we did is we looked at the UK's uh, reception class, which is the entry year of primary school in the UK at ages four to five. And there used to be traditionally a system in the UK where some local authorities would um, defer entry of the youngest children um, to the second or third term of the academic year. And so we analyzed this, these policies where some children started reception class on time in the September of the academic year. And, and some children, typically the younger ones, would start um, reception class at one or two terms um, later. And what we did, we, we compared local authorities in which the youngest were deferred by one or two terms 
with local authorities where the youngest were not deferred. And so everyone entered in September. And then we could see whether the, these young, younger deferred children actually had a benefit from being deferred or not. And what we found is actually deferring by one or two terms created a disadvantage to them. We could still find a disadvantage um, two years later at the, uh, at the end of year two. And then um, even at age 11, this disadvantage in test scores leveled off, but we still could see that these deferred children um, get, from some survey data had some worse results in terms of some non-cognitive skills. That's incredible. Um, he's saying that being deferred by just a few months when you're five years old could have a detrimental effect right through to the age of 11 and potentially, I suppose, even beyond. He was basically saying that the evidence overwhelmingly showed that kids don't benefit from being deferred. Um, they looked at teachers' assessments of these kids when they were aged five and then compared it annually. And uh, they could detect that this disadvantage in the teachers' observations during reception class all the way up to kids being tested at 11 years old. And, and he also said, Mari, that even after 11, there were some long-lasting non-cognitive disadvantages that didn't level off. Yes, exactly. So that's measured in things like how much a child enjoys school or whether or not they have a tendency to disruptive behaviours. Um, and Professor Cornelison said that some of these disadvantages are much longer-lasting than others um, and that it's, it's been suggested that young fear children um, can have sort of lower self-esteem uh, which may in turn have further impacts on their behaviour and achievement much later on. Um, but another really, really important point that he made was about how primary school um, is a really important leveller for children from different backgrounds. We kind of touched on this earlier. It gives all kids equal opportunities. If you think about the UK reception class environment again, where children are aged four to five, there isn't really a formal homework. So the only thing that there is in terms of homework is that children bring home books from school um, that they're supposed, the parents are supposed to read to them. And so um, I think that is a very beneficial type of homework, which gets children interested in reading and listening to stories. And you could then imagine of how that effect might be, that positive effect of that might be actually stronger for children from disadvantaged backgrounds who may not have access to a local library or who may not have um, as much books at home as children from more advantaged background or whose parents have less time because they have to work. Now, this is very important. But education, I agree, should be accessible for everyone, regardless of class, race and gender and so on. And I think it is in Britain. But I think the difference is how parents approach education. Um, but primary school is a great way of making sure all kids uh, get access to the same kinds of resources from that early age. Yeah, I mean, by and, by and large, I think you're right. And I, I think it's also interesting um, how this question, what is the right age to start school, forces us to think a little bit about which factors define right, what makes it right, what makes it the right age. And um, you have children and recently grandchildren. Uh, what, do you, what do you hope that an education does for you? the children of your family. I guess what we really want from an education is to become basically just a, a happy, useful member of society and hopefully uh, a contributor to the economy and with <laughs> a few quid in the bank. Yes. I mean, I, I can't disagree with you on that, I think. Um, but before we go, uh, I did think that it was fair amongst the other experts that we spoke to um, that we also spoke to some children um, and that we should probably give them the last word on this. Uh, I also absolutely love interviewing kids because they are so honest. Um, and I ask kids from around the world uh, what age they thought they should have started school. And here's a, a selection. Hi, my name's Sophia. I am 13 years old and I'm from Berlin. We start school at the age of about six. I was six and a half. And I think that's a very good age to start school because I think if you're younger, you want to run around on the playground, you want to be loud, you want to have fun, but you don't want to sit in the classroom where you have to be quiet and sit still for quite a long time. My name is Suhid. I live in Delhi and I'm 12 years old. In India, the age of admission for schools is not defined. I feel like the admissions should start from four years because at that age, the child has proper motor skills and can study. My name is Toglu. I am from Baku and I am 14 years old. In Azerbaijan, we start primary school 
when we are six, and I think we should start school at four, so we can become more knowledgeable at a younger age and gain more skills. Hi, I'm Harriet Cotter. I used to live in England, but I live in America now. I think that children should go to school at five years of age because children of five years of age can spend the entire day at school because four-year-olds don't have enough energy to take them through the entire day. So they miss out on a lot of learning and it is quite hard for the parents to go back and forth from school. Kia ora. my name is India Kennings. I'm from Whangmata in New Zealand and I'm 11 years old. In New Zealand, we start school when we're five and I think it's too early because I don't think that kids that age should be stuck in a classroom with the teacher putting random knowledge into their brains. They should be outside playing with their friends, exploring and enjoying being a five-year-old. I can't remember learning anything from the age five to seven and that's why I think they should start school at seven years old. Stephen, do you remember what you learned between the ages of five and seven? Well, it's a long time ago now. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. But it seems that all of our experts are less concerned with the starting age uh, and more interested, like the children as well, and mm. more interested in what type of education children get, whether it really does ignite some kind of passion in you for, for lifelong learning. Absolutely. I think that's been the main takeaway for me as well, is that the age is a matter of semantics. It's, it's more important to look at the issues of sort of standardised testing and school structures and how kids are learning and the sort of curriculum rather than this sort of binary idea of, of, of ages. It also seems the overarching belief is that small children, um, children aged uh, four, five and six, should be encouraged to explore and play as they learn. Yes. Um, I think despite the starting age gap between countries, the type of schooling is quite similar, as um, Stephen McCord said in Northern Ireland. Um, he was saying in, in Finland, uh, formal education doesn't start till seven, but their pre-primary schools are actually very similar to UK primary schools where, where children start age four or five. And that can only be good news when, 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 when people agree. Yes, exactly, especially us, Stephen. I think us agreeing on something will definitely be one for the history books. Uh, well, it won't be repeated, uh, Mari. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. Uh, and even if we didn't answer the question with a simple yes or no, we thought about some of the issues that it's turned up. And we're hoping you, our audience, will get in touch if you've got a burning question or a reaction to this podcast. Uh, that you would like uh, answered. Find us on CGTN Europe's Facebook or Twitter page. And you can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or Spotify. And thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.